Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's that time of the year, the end of the year. Today, we're going to be talking about my top 10 favorite comic books of 2018. That's right, everybody. Welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. It's the end of 2018, and yet again, we had a golden age of comic books this year. Fantastic works from all publishers. Fantastic stuff. Great writers, great artists, great stories, great characters. It was just such a privilege to read comic books this year. So, of course, I gotta list my top ten of the year, but a few shout-outs, first of all. Um, These Savage Shores, just two issues in, third issue coming up, but that book has been fantastic. It's been splendid. Also from Vault Comics, Friendo, definitely one to look out for. And from Aftershock Comic, I gotta give a big shout-out and a big, big honorable mention to Hot Lunch Special by Elliot Ray Hall and Jorge Fornes. A great crime story with great noirish art that's very David Masekelian. Fantastic stuff. But without further ado, let's get right into it. I know you're waiting for it. My top 10 favorite comic books of the year. At number 10, I've got Justice League. Justice League by Scott Snyder, James Tinney and Jim Chung, Jorge Jimenez, Alejandro Sanchez, and others. A lot of different creators have gone into making Scott Snyder's vision of the Justice League one of my favorite comic books of the year. It's just, it awakens that fanboy inside of me, that young, that young comic book fan, right? I love the Justice League lineup. It's great. So you got the big seven there, including Martian Manhunter. I love the renewed focus on Martian Manhunter in this book by Scott Snyder. But you also got Superman, Flash, Wonder Woman, Batman, and other characters like Jon Stewart's Green Lantern and Hot Girl. Fantastic characters that really work together. Aquaman, but the big spotlight of this is Lex Luthor. Straight up back to being a villain in the pages of DC Comics, and Scott Snyder is doing it splendidly, in my opinion. I love what Luthor is doing, his his plans, his his machinations, and he's brought back the Legion of Doom. So you got Joker, Black Mana. Cheetah, Sinestro, Gorilla Grodd, fantastic villains, and some of the absolute best and most recognizable superheroes in pop culture. Absolutely. Justice League has been fun. It's been slam bang wall. It's almost Hickman esque, but with that rock and roll Scott Snyder flair. Some of these stories, the, the things happen. They're so big, they're so bombastic, it's so just absurd, but it's so fun, and I love the ride that Scott Snyder's been taking us on. This totality story that's kind of spun out of the ramifications from his DC Dark Knight's Metal story from last year with Greg Capullo, and of course the new Justice one sh uh, miniseries that launched in this year. James Tiny IV comes in to help him every once in a while. Jorge Jimenez's artwork is dynamic, it's flamboyant, it's fantastic, it is so good. Jim Chung jumping over to Mar from Marvel to 2DC for two bookend things in the totality story, two bookend issues. Fantastic work, highly detailed, Rick's rich, textured. Other artists have come in of late. Um, Doug Monkey, um, uh, uh, Mikael Jenin, and, and, and Francis Manipool, for instance. Great artwork, great giant characters, and a great giant story that is just now starting to unfold. But the big spotlight for me is Lex Luthor. It's coming in at number 10. At number nine, I've got Abbott from Boom Studios and writer Saladin Ahmed, artist Sammy Cavella, colorist Jason Wordy, and letterer Jim Campbell. This book is fantastic. It was earlier on in the year. It's a five-issue miniseries from Boom Studio. It's set in Detroit in 1972, and it's about Abbott. And Abbott is an investigative journalist. She's a black woman. She's in 72 Detroit, and she's shining a light on stories that maybe the white press doesn't want to be illuminated, right? So it's a great hard-boiled crime story from a, uh, uh, it's like a detective type story, but from an investigative journalist type uh, vibe. Really great stuff, great dialogue, great artwork. Cavella's artwork with Wordy's coloring, amazing. Campbell is, spe is spectacular on the lettering. I love the lettering in this. It really flows well, helps keep the pace of the issues. Um, fantastic story, but it also has a supernatural tinge. So if you like uh, noirish 70s crime stories, but with a little bit of supernatural to it. Fantastic stuff. I really like it. A true, um, it's, it's, it's a true Campbellian, Campbellian, whatever. It's a true hero's journey, and it's really, really well done, well laid out, well executed, great artwork. The coloring by Jason Wordy is fantastic. We will be talking about Jason Wordy here in just a few minutes again, because his work is splendid. It's amazing. Ahmed is definitely an up-and-coming writer now. He's just launched Miles Morales' Spider-Man. He's been doing Exiles recently for Marvel. 
He's a big name that's going to just break through in the comic book industry. I guarantee it. Fantastic stuff. Abbott, if you haven't read it, I guarantee it. You'll love it. At number eight, we've got Venom, written by Donny Case, with artwork by Ryan Stegman, inking by J.P. Meyer, coloring by Frank Martin, and lettering by Clayton Cowles. This is the only appearance of a Marvel comic book on this list. That's usually just the norm, but Venom has been the standout hit from Marvel, in my opinion. Donny Case has taken Venom already, admittedly, one of my favorite characters over at Marvel, and... Eddie Brock is now Venom again. I'm excited about that. But Donny Cates is just telling a great Venom story and redefining the mythology of Venom, redefining the history of Venom, while he's telling a great story, a very rich, emotionally dense story about isolation, codependency, abandonment. It's amazing, fantastic stuff. Ryan Stegman's artwork is the best of his career, highly detailed, very intricate, Great composition to it. Mayer's art, uh, pencil, uh, lettering, inking on top of that is great. Martin's colors at first seem a little too subdued, but then once you get into the story and capture that tone, that tone of just, of like I said, abandonment, codependency, isolation, longing for something. Great stuff. Taking the character of Eddie Brock and the symbiote, redefining their relationship, their origins. Really great stuff in that big bombastic Marvel comic book superhero type way. Venom was always one of my favorite heroes, but never really had a book that really could have been all that it could have been. This is the best Venom book they've ever done, and in my opinion, the best Marvel comic of the year. At number seven, we've got Ice Cream Man from Image Comics, written by W. Maxwell Prince, with artwork by Martin Morazzo and coloring by Chris O'Halloran. First of all, the coloring in this book is spectacular. O'Halloran is definitely one of my favorite up-and-coming colorists in the industry. Bold choices, um, f just phosphorescent, just lights up the page sometimes, very neon-esque. Appropriately so, with the sickly sweet tone of Ice Cream Man, which is a horror anthology. Each issue is its own story, but it's all set in this one suburban town where this Ice Cream Man comes through. He's got some kind of weirdness about him. Maybe he's a demon. It seems like he's also a werewolf, a shapeshifter of some sort, but he kind of puts a little bit of a touch on somebody's life and spins their story into this really, really tragic and just crazy thing, right? But Ice Cream Man, so it's this horror anthology with great juxtaposition with the with the overly um, sickly sweet colors that are involved. Morales' artwork is, is intricate and delicate as well and has room to breathe. The composition is great. My favorite singular issue of the year comes from Ice Cream Man. It's the issue Strange Neapolitan. I believe that's issue number six. Just a great. And one of the best things that W. Maxwell Prince does with Ice Cream Man and why it makes my top ten list is the tone, is the atmosphere, is the mood that is captured with the story. The idea that we all go through suffering, we all go through longing, but there's also stories not just about suffering and longing, but s true stories about redemption, stories about hope. Really interesting stuff. Like I said, each issue is its own story, but there's an overall story that's being told, and it's being told through images, it's being told through symbolism, it's being told through music in the, in the lyrical dialogue throughout the story. It's such an amazing, uh, ethereal, horror, fantasy, dark comic book that just absolutely makes the top ten. At number six, we've got Fearscape from Vault Comics and writer Ryan O'Sullivan, artist Andrea Muti, colorist Vladimir Popov, and lettering by And World Design. This book is splendid and only three issues are out and I almost did not consider it for my top 10, but I had to. This book has just come out of the woodwork and it's amazing. The basic idea is the fearscape is this plane of existence where all of our hopes and fears, especially our fears, because hence the fearscape, all of our fears exist and manifest on this plane of existence. And once a generation, a muse has to come to Earth and pick the greatest storyteller of that generation. And that storyteller comes and defeats the fears of all mankind. And we can continue to prosper and stay alive for yet another generation. But this time, instead of finding the world's greatest storyteller, they find the world's greatest plagiarist. But and this book is so amazing, it's cool, and the narrative flow is great. It is told from the perspective of Henry Henry, who is said plagiarist, but it does a great, not just talking about the story itself, but it really speaks a lot about 
narrative structure, about the structure of story, about the meaning, about the essence, about the origin of story, right? Really great stuff from the get-go. The first issue, the second issue, the third issue, fantastic, splendid. The artwork is ethereal. It's great, brilliant, beautiful colors. Really fits the tone of the story. O'Sullivan has really outdid himself with this one. Great stuff. Two issues left, I believe, and 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 the editors have said you don't even know what's going on yet. I'm really excited to see the finale of this. I think if had the finale happened, because I have high hopes that it's really going to end strong, would have been higher on the list. But only three issues in, definitely got to make the top ten with the Vault Comics. Fear Escape, such a great book. You can find it out right now. It's fantastic. At number five, I've got Eternity Girl from DC Young Animal, written by Magdalene Visaggio, art by Sonny Liu, coloring by Chris Chuckery, and lettering by the, the, the hero of lettering, comic book lettering, Todd Klein. This book is amazing, and it feels like a, an old-school 90s Vertigo book in the best sense of what that can mean. Visaggio crafts a great script about a superhero who has suicidal thoughts. This is a, sui this is a suicidal superhero. Um, she was accidentally transformed. She, can, she can't die. She's thus the Eternity Girl. She's dealing with a lot of, of mental health issues, depression, and it's a great story that really focuses in on that, but it's also a great meta story where it's also about comic books. It's also about these, these characters who have their histories written and rewritten and rewritten and over and over and over again and how that relates to someone going through a struggle with mental health or something where where others feel like they have a say where others feel like they can they can tell you the easy fix but when you're just tired of it and you're tired of it all and you're trying to end it but eternity girl is a superheroine who wants to kill herself but can't ever succeed but maybe she finds a way she can only kill herself and thus destroy the multiverse at the same time. It's a great book with really weird, quirky type stuff, exactly what we came expected to come out of DC Young Animal. This stuff is right in the vein of some early Grant Morrison, some early Warren Ellis, not early, early Warren Ellis, but that, that, that post-early Warren Ellis where it's really, really solid. Visaggio, Lou, and the rest, they've done an amazing job. Sunny Lou's artwork is amazing. It really fits and captures the tone of the story. Chuck Reed's colors are very muted, but it, like, once again, just like Lou's pencils, really fit the tone of this story. Hats off the best work, in my opinion, from all involved. I love Eternity Girl. It's sad to see DC Young Animal go away, at least for a bit, probably for a long bit. But Visaggio is stating the fact right now that she is going to be a force to be reckoned with in the industry. At number four, I've got Doomsday Clock from DC Comics, written by Jeff Johns, artwork by Gary Frank, coloring by Brad Anderson, and lettering by Rob Lee. This is a nice love letter to The Watchmen, but it's a great... And, and profound exploration on DC's, especially the superheroes, especially Superman's hope and optimism against the cynical nature of books like The Watchmen, where The Watchmen would deconstruct superheroes, right? And Superman is this, this larger-than-life god, basically, right? And so to take The Watchmen and to take DC and to thematically tie them in together and have them clash against each other we thought that this is the book that it was going to sink or swim one way or another, right? It's been swimming. It's been flying. It's been soaring. Doomsday Clock to me is one of the best books of the year. Jeff Johns is pumping out the best scripts of his of his career. Absolutely, the thematically um, just great. The way it ties into some 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 socially and culturally relevant topics of the day. The way that Gary Frank and Brad Anderson uh, completely respect what Dave Gibbons and Alan Moore did before, but translate it into today's style, but still definitely in that mold of the Watchmen, the pacing, the composition, everything, right? This is the book that a lot of people may not be down for, especially on a top 10, because they're against the idea of DC playing around with the Watchmen. I'm down for that. I just want a cool story. I like the idea of Jeff Johns exploring the effects of what the comic book, The Watchmen, did in our real world uh, to characters like Superman, to characters like Batman. And I really like seeing these characters work together. And that's really fun to see Ozymandias against, you know, interact with Lex Luthor and Batman with, with, and Joker with Rorschach and things like that. But I also like the continuation of The Watchmen saga. It, it makes a narrative sense to me. I understand the flow. I really love the artwork by Frank. Anderson's doing such a great job of doing some modern, very, very luscious and rich colors that provide a lot of texture and atmosphere to the book, but still maintaining and keeping an homage-type tone 
to the original. It has a connection to the original. I love it. Other people may not. I don't know. It's my number four book of the year. I think they're doing an exceptional job on Doomsday Clock, and I cannot wait to see where we're going. Each issue is an event. Each issue is singular and awesome, and the overall story is is just extraordinarily um, uh, interesting, complex, and just slam-bang fun. At number three, we've got Wasted Space from Vault Comics, writer Michael Morrissey, artist Hayden Sherman, colorist Jason Wordy, and letterer Jim Campbell. When we were talking about Abbott earlier, I talked to you about how we were going to talk about Jason Wordy again and Jim Campbell. Campbell's lettering, Wordy's colors really add such a texture, such an atmosphere to this book, and it's amazing. But Sherman and Morrissey have created this amazing sci-fi world that's really fun. It's it's satire. Um... It's, it's just splendid. It's basically what if you took Preacher and Philip K. Dick and kind of merged them together, right? Star Wars meets Preacher, almost in a way. Really fun stuff. The, 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 the world that's built is great. And there's this empire, just like in Star Wars. And there was this prophet, and the prophet saw, heard the voice of God, the voice of the Creator. And the voice of the Creator led his people into this oppressive totalitarian empire, right? And so he's, he's disenfranchised, he's faithless, he's, he's, he's rebelling against his religion, he's just out there doing all kinds of drugs, he's got, he's got a prostitute robot as his best friend, and the friendships, the characters, they shine, they're great. And now something has happened where once again he has to be called upon to fight against the creator and help in this evil empire. Really great stuff. Like I said, it's got the satire... Um, the satirical tone of a book like Preacher, something like that, but almost in a world kind of set up like Star Wars. Really fun stuff, but with some really cool Philip K. Dick uh, philosophy type stuff. Voice of Space has been fun. It's 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 raunchy. It's it's it's, it's extravagant. Hayden Sherman's uh, artwork is really really rough, very gritty, and to me it fits the tone and the pace of the story perfectly. It's one of my favorite books of the year. My favorite comic book from Vault Comics in the year, who I think is the publisher of the year. Wasted Space, if you haven't checked it out, I highly encourage you to. Um, absolutely one of the best comics of the year, number three. At number two, we've got Mr. Miracle from DC Comics and writer Tom King, artist Mitch Garretts, and letterer Clayton Cowles. Mr. Miracle was a darling the last year when everybody was doing their end of the year list. It made my top ten back then, but I even said a year ago, I really need to see how this, how this shakes out, see how high it's going to go. Number two is how high it went. This book has been amazing, and it really, really nailed the ending. Tom King has crafted a story about philosophy. He's crafted a story about, about life about a quarter-life crisis, about family. He's taken this, this idea of Jack Kirby's New Gods, and he's thrown this giant crazy, one of the craziest. So if you really look that, if you just read this book and look into what is actually happening as far as the New Gods are concerned, it is one of the most epic New Gods adventures out there, right? But what Tom King does is he tells a story of the mundane. He tells the story of a man trying to overcome a suicide attempt. He's talking about a man who's trying to escape. What's he trying to escape? Scott Free's trying to escape everything. He's got a traumatic past, right? He was raised on Apocalypse by Granny Goodness. He was given up by his father, um, the god of New Genesis. He was given up and raised on Apocalypse. He was raised in a life of torture. But through that, he found love with Big Barda, right? And this story is about their relationship. And it's even about some of the more mundane aspects of their relationship, but tied into the biggest moments of, of a relationship with another person. I love this book so much. It says so much, so amazingly so, right? And it's got a very ambiguous ending, and I love the fact that it has an ambiguous ending. A lot of people think it might be tied in, including me. Maybe it could be tied into some things like Heroes in Crisis. I think that would actually take away from the story. It stands strong at 12 issues. It's really, really good. Mitch Garrett's artwork, amazing. The colors are brilliant. He definitely deserved the Eisner for Best Artist of the Year. The stuff is just amazing. The whole thing is told in a nine-panel grid. It's a very rigid structure. It's very constricting for an artist to work in that kind of a format. But Mitch Garrett's excels. And Tom King's uh, necessary use of that structure for the book is exceptionally well done. Fantastic stuff. Love this book. Clayton Cowles. I don't know if anybody could have lettered this book any better. Fantastic work. Clayton Cowles is one of the preeminent letters, letterers in the industry right now. Don't sleep on your letterer because they help the flow of the story. Sometimes... 
It's not the writing that's bad and the art that's taking you out of the story. Sometimes it's just some bad lettering. Clayton Cowles, one of the best letters in the business. Number two, Mr. Miracle. Love that book so much. And at number one, Gideon Falls. From Image Comics and creator Jeff Lemire, artist Andrea Sorrentino, colorist Dave Stewart, and letterer Steve Wands. Gideon Falls is the best comic book of the year. I was pretty cemented on this. From the moment I started reading this book, I thought it was so exceptionally well done. An urban horror story with a very atmospheric tone. Sorrentino's artwork is, is levels above what we're used to. His artwork already has a very striking graphic design and composition to it, but he adds this element of texture, of, of almost like wood etching into the artwork. And then you put Dave Stewart, probably the best comic book colorist that has ever lived is Dave Stewart. He's colored all the Magnolia stuff. He's done some of the absolute most preeminent um, and best comic books of all time. Dave Stewart is, I think he's the best comic book colorist of all time. Add that on top of Sorrentino. Add that on top of Lemire being able to tell melancholy stories that are very bittersweet, that, that, that tinge a little bit of that, that hopeful resentment inside of you about life. That life could have went another way. Uh, life, is, life, life is not fair. But, but it's also sweet, and there's a lot of delicacy to it, right? Take that typical Lemire style, but throw it into a horror story that's just great. That's a little bit Lovecraftian, that's very experimental, very eccentric. Sorrentino, Lemire, Stewart, they get really, really experimental here, and especially Juan with the lettering. Really experimental uh, with the uh, art of sequential storytelling. Great stuff. The Black Barn, it's a mystery. It's about this small town. It's about a priest overcoming adversity. It's about a young man trying to find himself and trying to find sanity in his own thought process. And, and is he crazy or, or is something really happening? And it's, it's, it's got such a great composition to it. When I was rereading it re re recently, I was noticing things in the artwork by Sorrentino and Stewart that I never noticed before. This, like, mirrored compositions, you know, one vertical, one upside down. What does that mean? There's so much put into every single image, every single word, every single word balloon, every single, every single, everything. Every page, every line, every letter, everything about this book is intentional. It's, it's, it's splendid. It's well executed. It's atmospheric. It's moody. And to me, the best comic book of 2018. So that's my top 10. I want to know. What are your favorite comic books of 2018? Let me know in the comments down below. Once again, like I said, a great year for comic books. I'm excited to share my love for comic books with you continuing on into 2019. So join us every week for the weekly comic book review. Join us over at Patreon if you want to help support this channel. Patreon.com slash PCP. Join us for live streams every Sunday, 7 o'clock Central PM time. We have a lot of fun here on this channel, spreading a love of pop culture, movies, TV, but especially comic books and a lot more of that content coming in 2019. So thank you guys so much for rocking with us. Please do like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. And join us over at Facebook, our Facebook group, the official PCP Facebook group, PCP Army. Find it, join us, talk about our love of comic books, movies, and more. Thank you guys so much for rocking with us. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups. Keep top tenning, keep reading, keep living, keep being the best you can be. And in 2019, get mean and make it better than ever.